Good morning. My name is Judy L. Longenecker. I want to welcome you to this worship service at Emmanuel Baptist Church in Willowdale, Toronto. Wherever you are watching from today, I invite you to participate in this service, and I pray that you'll feel the touch of God's Spirit as you join us in worship. Let us prepare our hearts and minds as we listen to this morning's prelude. Good morning. Welcome as we gather to worship. Put your confidence in God, for all those who have God as their helper will rejoice. God gives justice to the oppressed and food to the hungry. God frees the prisoners and opens the eyes of the blind. So put your trust in God's goodness and let God's reign endure forever. Come, let us worship God.
greatest song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Jesus, the name above every other name Jesus, the only one who could ever say Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you We live for you the name above every other name Jesus the only one who could ever say worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you
Good morning, boys and girls. Catherine here. How are you? I hope you've all had a great summer with lots of outdoor activity. And I know that this week you start back to school. I'd like to pray for you as you and your families adjust to this transition. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you so much for the girls and boys of Emmanuel. Please bless them as they, and their parents and families as they prepare and go back to school. I ask that you would keep them well and that you would give the parents and families peace and comfort as the children start back to school. We trust you, Lord, and we thank you for your every blessing. Amen. Bye. Today's reading is from Matthew chapter 21, verses 12 to 13. Jesus entered the temple courts and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. We are also reading from Isaiah chapter 56, verse 7. These I will bring to my holy mountain and give them joy in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. And finally, our last scripture for today is Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 11. Has this house which bears my name become a den of robbers to you? But I have been watching, declares the Lord. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. It is my pleasure to introduce this morning's guest speaker, Cheryl Bear. Cheryl Bear was formerly the, the Indigenous Relations Specialist for Canadian Baptist Ministries, and today more than ever we need to hear her voice as Canadian Baptists seek to build bridges of understanding and reconciliation with Indigenous communities. We welcome Cheryl with this message that she recorded last year, and we pray that her words will inspire us to pursue racial justice in our country. Hi, everybody. Hari Suna, Cheryl Bresley, Natle Wastan, Demdenusli. My name is Cheryl Bear, and I'm from the beautiful village of Natle Wastan First Nation, which is where I'm at right now. Um, I'm actually in my, um, what used to be my grandpa's house, now it's my auntie's house. And uh, this, I'm in the room that I spent, a, I used to say, I usually say, about half my childhood and uh, so it's um, it's good to be here on the land uh, and to to share with you today so uh, this sermon is um, I gave a scripture in Mark to be read and uh, and as I was doing some um, some of the research I was like oops actually uh, I gave you a scripture in Matthew Matthew 21 verse uh, 12 and 13 but the verse, um, and it's a good one, if it was read, it's, it's perfect. Uh, uh, but there's a little bit more. Uh, Mark goes into, goes a little bit further. And this is part of what I wanted to talk about was, uh, so I'll read this, uh, Mark 11, uh, verse 17, where Jesus, uh, he's just cleaned out the temple. He's just thrown tables over and he, he's just disrupted a whole lot of stuff in, um, uh, in the temple. So in, uh, in Mark, uh, Jesus says to them, the scriptures declare, and so he's quoting scripture here, my temple will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have turned it into a den of thieves. And he's uh, actually reflecting on Isaiah 56 verse 7 and Jeremiah 7 11. Uh, and in the Isaiah scripture, uh, it says, I will bring them to my holy mountain of Jerusalem, and I will fill them with joy in my house of prayer. And I will, and I will accept their burnt offerings and sacrifices because my temple will be called a house of prayer for all nations. And, and that's a significant scripture that this area in the temple was reserved for all nations. So we know that, um, back in the day, back in, in the Old Testament, that it was very, very exclusive 
the the word of God, the chosen people, uh, they were the ones that had you know God visit them, and so it was it was a very they're very special. They still are, they still are very special. And I um, I always uh, as the Bible says, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And and I think that yes, the beautiful people of um, uh, the beautiful uh, Hebrew people definitely deserve our prayers and need our prayers. Um, but this, you know, and, and we, we, we sort of have told ourselves, well, we're grafted in and now we are a part of, you know, the Bible now talks to us and it speaks specifically uh, to us. Uh, and, and, and I think that's very true. There's applications for where God is speaking to us and we are his called ones. Um, and, uh, uh, and, but, but I like to read the Bible in context. I like to think about um, when it was written and uh, who said the words and to whom they were saying these words and just try to, to see it through their eyes. Because so often we as Christians, we just read the Bible and we just let our culture, we just let our Canadian uh, 2020 culture uh, read the Bible for us. And, and I think that, um, you know, it, and I think application, like I said, there's, there's plenty of room for application, but, um, also context uh, is pretty important. So, uh, so that's why I like going back in time to all of this. Uh, and, um, and when we read, as I said, the, the scripture in Mark and Matthew, Jesus is quoting Isaiah and, and Jeremiah, and, and it's Isaiah that says the house of prayer for all nations. That's that quote. Um, but in, um, in Jeremiah, he goes into uh, stuff about the temple. And he says uh, in verse 5, uh, but I, and it's uh, the Lord talking here, but I will be merciful only if you stop your evil thoughts and deeds and start treating each other with justice. Only, verse 6, only if you stop exploiting foreigners, orphans, and widows. Only if you stop your murdering. Only if you stop harming yourselves by worshipping idols. Then I will let you stay in the land that I gave to your ancestors to keep forever. And, and yeah, and it's, it's, it's quite a dire, um, strong, strong words for us. Uh, and for the, for the people of Israel, uh, Judah, I believe, specifically. Um, and, and so I think like this is all concerning the temple and it's all concerning, um, sacrifice and, you know, it goes on before that about how, you know, the men are working to, to provide the sacrifice and the women are working to provide the, the, the sacrifice. Um, but then God talks about, um, all of these other things that they're doing. And it's interesting to me because I kind of feel like, like we're a little bit like that as well. We sort of feel like we're doing our thing. We're doing our thing and, and, you know, believing that we're, you know, maybe not preparing a sacrifice to bring to the temple, of course. Uh, those, those days are gone. But um, we, we, we say our prayers and we, and we try to share God's love with people. And we, we do all of these things. We do all of these things as Christians. And, and sometimes we, we don't see the bigger picture we're, we're busy doing these things, but we don't see the things that are going on. And, and when God talks about justice in this scripture um, and, and the lack of justice, the, the injustice that's happening in, in, in these scriptures, um, exploiting foreigners, orphans, and widows, those kind of things, um, it it's almost seems like uh, th they're not seeing those things. They're not, they're not seeing that they're doing those things. And, and we can of, also often wonder and sort of go, what's, what's wrong with you guys? Like, how come you didn't see all this stuff that's going on? Like, it's like right under your nose. How could you be so blind to some of the stuff that's going on? And, uh, but I think we do it today as well. You know, I used to always be, I don't know, I think when I was younger, I'd read the Bible and I'd be like, what is up with these Israelites? Like, they're constantly... You know, in the Old Testament, you just kind of see them going like back to the Lord and then falling down and then back to the Lord and then doing like heinous things and then going back to the Lord. And it's just this roller coaster of 
back and forth. And some of the stuff like this, you kind of think, okay, how come you guys didn't, didn't pick up on that? Like what's going on? But in, in my journey as a Christian and I'm 51 years old right now. So, uh, it's been a while. I've been a Christian since I was eight and had some crazy teachings when I was at some churches when I was younger. Um, <clears throat> and some really good, uh, good, a good education, I believe, good, solid Christian education. And, and I think there are still some things in, in my life that I miss. There are still some things that I overlook that I sort of, I, and I learn, and you maybe have to do this as well. We learn our best lessons, uh, in hindsight, when we go through stuff and we look back and, and then, you know, and I kind of go and look back on, Hmm, you know, yeah, 20 years ago, this and that happened. And, you know, I think I would have done things differently today. I didn't really quite get what was going on. And I didn't know myself very well. And I didn't, I didn't, you know, all of these things. And, and so hindsight is a awful teacher because it always feels like it's a little too late. It's sort of like, oh, I missed the boat on that one. And, and sometimes there's times where, you know, uh, I, I'll sort of sense God's direction in something and then I'll mess it up. And I'm, I always pray. I'm like, God, please don't stop talking to me because I'm such a dumb dumb <laughs> because I'm so slow to learn because I'm so, you know, I just, I relate to Peter in the Bible. He just keeps putting his foot in his mouth and messing up. And somehow God, you know, Jesus still reaches out to him and grabs his face kind of a thing. Uh, and so I, I take co great comfort in, in that. Uh, but when it comes to injustice in, in society and, and what I think some of the things that, uh, that these folks might have been overlooking, and I'm not going to go into it too much, the stuff that was going on around uh, Jeremiah's time, um, but just to focus on us today and some of the things. And, and of course, Jesus is... Let's go back to the main scripture where, you know, Jesus is mid-throw with some tables while he's quoting these guys. And so all of his fellow um, Jewish, the Jewish leaders, his friends, of course, they are, they are raised in this stuff. You know, you will hear stories about um, Jewish kids who learn scriptures. They, they memorize the whole Psalms. They they are raised in this, and, and this, is, this is a part of their, uh, their language, their culture. <clears throat> so I had a prof um, who said, it was a, a Professor uh, Rick Watts, and he talked about um, uh, when, when uh, Jesus would say things, when he, whenever he would quote the Old Testament, um, uh, he would, um, to, to us, we just kind of go, oh, what's that? You know, maybe we'll even miss it. We don't even realize, except for our little footnotes, our handy little footnotes in our Bible. Oh, there's um, two other places where this is. So let's go back and read those and we can connect. But to the Jewish mind, especially in Jesus' day, that would have been like, they would have gotten it immediately. They would have just known. And uh, Rick Watts said um, that it's like the, um, that old speech. And I'm not even, I'm not an American, so I don't know the speech, but he was talking to a uh, a lot of Americans in the group, and he said, four score, and, and then they all finished the sentence. And I don't even, I can't even finish it, because, like I said, I'm not American. But, but almost everybody, most Canadians can, too. I'm just not very good with numbers, other than, so I should know that speech, because it's part of history. But, um, but just like that, that was his example, and every American in that room, and myself as well, when I heard them all, quote that, they, they got it. They understood. When Jesus speaks these words and he quotes the Old Testament, every single Hebrew uh, mind would go to those scriptures. Every single, their ears would have been, would have been like, I know this. I know where this came from. I remember um, one of my friends who, uh, uh, one of my dear friends, and we went to a, um, a prayer meeting and there's a lot of native people and she's Kainai. And it, they used to say Blackfoot. So she's from around uh, Lethbridge area. And, uh, and we walked into this meeting and, and she, and I heard somebody speaking in um, a different language, a native language. 
And I didn't know what they were saying, but she just right away, she said, I know what they're saying. This is my language. And she understood everything they were saying. And it was just powerful as I saw the look on her face. And you don't normally go into a, you know, kind of a church setting, sort of expecting to hear that. So it was beautiful. And it, we were way off in the States and uh, Sacramento at the time. But to hear something that's in your in your language, in your, something that you've known since you were young, it changes everything. So when Jesus is talking here, and he's, like I said, mid-throw, tables in the air, and he's quoting Isaiah and Jeremiah, they're all paying attention. And he's saying, you have turned my father's house into a den of thieves. <clears throat> and he's saying that this is supposed to be a house of prayer for all nations. Now we know the exclusivity of the of the temple that there was only there was a special place for just the holy of holies there was that was a very sacred space then there was the this other space where the priests could go but no other person could go and then there was this other space where um the the the, the, the Jewish people could go and then there was this other space and that was this area here the 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 area of prayer for all of the other nations so all gentiles were welcome into that specific area of, uh, of of the temple. And so that's where we would find ourselves, uh, myself being a Gentile. Uh, so we find ourselves there, but Jesus finds instead of that being a space that's reserved for us, for, for everyone, he finds it full of money changers and, and people that are uh, turning a dime instead of turning their eyes to Jesus or to God in that setting. Uh, so he... He just tosses stuff. He just throws tables. And I have, I, I remember reading this when I was younger. And I would, I don't know, I went to some maybe really pious churches where Jesus was sort of thin and, and pasty and, and frail looking. And he was always very holy looking, but he didn't, he didn't really look like he could pick up a table, um, let alone throw one. And so when, when, Ever the scripture was was taught and I was a kid or a teenager, I'd always be like, huh, you know, I never thought you had it in you, Jesus. Like, I just, I don't know, maybe they painted him wrong and he's a little bit more burly than we imagine. I don't know, he hangs out with fishermen, they got to be doing something. But uh, um, for, for Jesus to be this upset also, that was the thing that got me because he seems rather too holy to be that upset and uh and uh and yet in these scriptures when you go when you go reading a little bit farther and and there is an even a scripture i'm not sure i think it was in the jeremiah section where it's uh, god is saying this is why i'm so angry <laughs> you know and 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 so in one sense it's it's kind of terrifying to think about god as angry and it's and and throwing tables and <clears throat> and I and I but I feel on the other hand that okay I I can see that and I get angry too I get angry at at injustice I get angry at things that happen to indigenous people here in Canada and people of color um, in Canada and the United States and we see it on TV all the time these days are are um are full of stories of that and my uh, my algorithm on facebook is just um um it's, it's just filled with injustice after injustice after injustice and there's um and it's and it's uh it hurts me it really bothers me deeply because this is stuff that's happened to me when i was uh when i was younger and there's stuff that still happens to indigenous people politically and socially and mentally emotionally physically these these are just things that are that are kind of a constant in our lives and so constantly having to deal with injustice constantly having to um to to figure this stuff out uh and 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 constantly sort of getting angry at injustice and some of this stuff that is talked about here you know the um murder and um and not being good to foreigners and orphans and widows and stuff like that. Um, <clears throat> this is what, what gets God angry. Injustice gets God angry. 
and it makes me feel like okay it's okay for me to do that it's okay for and it makes uh, I remember um, uh, hearing Eugene Peterson uh, speak one time and he said uh, he said um, when we talk about God being angry or you know all of those things and and you see in the Psalms too lots of doubt lots of um, uh, just reality anger and, and he says that's that um, this is proof that God allows us to be human and uh, and I I so appreciate those words because I always so I always felt like um, you know, being angry was just wrong and there's no place for it in, in church or in Christianity and stuff like that. And Jesus would just be so mad at me, oddly enough, for being angry. Uh, but I think that, you know, there's another scripture, be angry and sin not. And I think that that's an important one as well. Very important that we do something with how we're feeling about these things, that we don't just let these things slide. Because the more that we let things slide, the more that we clutter up the place where, where people are supposed to end up being, the more we put up tables and we start sort of giving in to, you know, little bits of idolatry. And, and that's where we, where we push people out and we end up um, uh, relegating people to, uh, you know, to not feeling welcome in church or not feeling good or churches being relegated to, to passivity and uh and and I don't mean like um I don't want you to be peaceful I think that's a good thing for sure let's let's do things um in a peaceful manner that you know hopefully nobody gets hurt but let's stand up for justice let's stand up for things that we see wrong in our society and I think that in Jesus example when we uh when we see things that are wrong when we when we learn about things, we have to we have then we're obligated to change them, and we're obligated to toss some tables ourselves. Um, in two thousand and eight, when uh, then Prime Minister of Canada gave an apology to residential school survivors, that was the first time that the majority of Canadians ever heard about the residential schools. Uh, before that, it was just us and you know officials and different um, different folks who knew about the residential schools. But, of course, we know, having uh, suffered them and endured them, my mom went to Lejack Residential School. Um, and, but, but having learned about them, and having the, most, the majority of Canadians say, and I had heard this for the 20 years before that, um, <clears throat> and just teaching about the residential schools, everyone, so many people came up to me, and said, like, there was a few, a very, very, very few people who said, oh, I knew about residential schools. Um, but um, majority of people said, oh, we, we had no idea. How could this have happened? And Canadians were angry. Canadians, majority of Canadians were like, how could the government have done this? How could we have not known about it for so many years? For our whole lives, we didn't know that anything like a residential school existed and, and that was the um, that was a reaction of of majority of Canadians that I talked to, and and it gave me it it really helped me to see that reaction to see that anger, that that honest gut reaction of how could this be how could we let this happen and and we never want this to happen again and of course that's that was the point that was what the residential schools wanted survivors wanted as well. They wanted to be able to tell their story so that this would never happen again. And, and now it's been, you know, quite a few years since, it was actually 2007 when they won the, the, um, the class action suit. We didn't, most didn't hear about it until the apology. Um, but now it's been all those years and we have now different things happening within our, um, our society. We see different things that, um, that indigenous people are still talking about um, uh, injustice, and and you don't have to look, you don't have to search very far to find some kind of injustice that's happening. Maybe not, maybe just down the road from where you live. And and what are we doing about those things? How are we making room uh, for for that stuff? And, and sometimes I think we have to throw some tables around. We need to shake things up. 
sometimes within our the old the places where we are the most comfortable and we feel the most safe sometimes those places get cluttered with different ideas or different thoughts and we have to remove some of those things in order for us to see the injustice that's all around us and to allow space for newcomers to fit in for for new people to be to to feel welcome uh and that's uh I think part of the journey that we're all on is this, this, this quest, this longing for reconciliation. And I believe that we, we, we're walking on that journey. It's going to be a long one, um, and a tough one. And I don't know if any of us have it completely figured out yet, but, uh, but we're, we're at least wanting to walk on it. And I think it's in the heart of God to reconcile God to man and, and mankind and, uh, and all of us to be reconciled as well together. It was in the heart of the residential school survivors when they chose this word, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, to share their stories. So I follow their mandate. I follow the mandate of reconciliation. And I believe in a lot of places we're talking actually about conciliation. I, that's a, a, probably a more apt word to use. But sticking with what the residential school survivors chose, let's... Um, Let's figure out what's in our lives, in our hearts, in our worldview. What is in that area of uh, this temple that we are not making room for other people? What have we allowed in, in that area that we have not allowed space for other people? Um, and in this case, I'm thinking specifically Indigenous, but um, also people of color in Canada and the United States. We have a lot of work to do, and, and I believe we're on a on a good path to do that. Thank you for listening to me. I appreciate all of my CBM family and friends. Talk soon. together in the congregational prayer. I'm Heidi. As the ageless and familiar refrain sings, Jesus, name above all names, beautiful Savior, glorious Lord. 
We come today in prayer, knowing who you are and coming just as we are. In praying, we are turning away from trusting in frail humanities. Instead, we are turning towards Jesus, Christ, the Son of the living God. Your thirsty people have found a fountain in Jesus. Praise you and thank you for surpassing all our sins with a grace that is found new every day. Thank you for all the encouraging messages and acts of kindness that have flowed through your people recently. May your spirit continue to strengthen and guide us to serve one another, living out the example that we have seen of being the feet and hands of Jesus. I pray especially for those who work in essential jobs. Lord, protect your people. Protect the health care system. Protect the school system. We pray for containment of COVID-19 in all of its various forms throughout this weary world. Into your loving hands, I commit all those who need your healing touch today. We pray for Shelly McNabb as her foot heals after injury and surgery. Lord, strengthen her and grant her peace under the challenges of limited mobility, especially given her upcoming wedding. Into your loving hands, I commit all those who are grieving. We pray for Sharon and Catherine, given the sudden loss of their mother, Sylvia Mead. Provide for them a significant time of celebration of Sylvia's life in light of the assurance that she is now with Jesus in paradise. Praise the Lord that reconciliation is the heart of God our Father. We pray over all the recommendations of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and seek a federal government that will act on these recommendations. We pray for progress in the relationship between the First Nations and the settlers of Canada. We pray for Brent Ostring and for others who have been called by God and empowered to act in Christ-like ways amongst Indigenous people, especially Indigenous youth. We thank you for the legacy of Tom Morikawa in ministering among the Indigenous people of Canada. We pray for Christians in Afghanistan, asking for protection and for provision for them through the upcoming winter months. We pray for provision for the over 4,000 Afghans who have arrived in Canada, asking that you would guide them in starting a new life here. Prepare churches to welcome them. Thank you for all your grace in the start of a new year of ministry through IBC. We lift up ministry leaders as your known and loved people. We pray for Reverend Mills for discernment and planning upcoming sermons. We pray for Natty and Judy for inspiration and planning worship. We pray for Lynn and Council for guidance to make decisions to lead the church into a future changed by shutdown. Thank you for the spiritual gifts and the life experiences with which you have equipped each of the leaders of IBC. We pray all things in the name of Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us, blessed Redeemer, living Word. May the Spirit keep us faithful, a people with eyes firmly fixed on Jesus. Amen. Morning, Emmanuel. As we gather around God's table for communion, let us pause and reflect on how Jesus' actions has freed us from sin. 
we are forgiven. As we come together, let us remove any distractions that we might have and give thanks as we remember that Jesus has conquered sin and death on the cross. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Join me as I pray for the bread. God, you are a God who loves deeply. You are a God who cares and desires to have a personal relationship with us. You sent your one and only son to die on the cross in order to restore relationship between us and you. God, we pray as we break bread that we remember your sacrifice on the cross for us. And we, we remember that we are forgiven, restored, whole again through Jesus. Thank you for that. Amen. Join me as we take part of the bread. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Join me as I pray for the cup. God, as you spilt your blood for us on the cross, we remember your sacrifice. We remember that you did this for us. Thank you, God, that you sent your son for us. God, may we remember the importance and the significance of this actions. May we do communion in remembrance of you and come to a deeper understanding of what this means and the significance of the bread and the cup. Thank you, God, for everything that you've done. In your name we pray, amen. Join me as we take part in the cup. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. May we understand the significance and declare the good news to those around us. May we show God's love to those in our community and beyond. Bless us as we head out from the table. And may we remember the importance of communion, not just the once a month that we do communion, but every single day. May we remember that we are forgiven. say thanks for the things you have done for me things so undeserved yet you gave to prove your love for me the voices of a million angels my gratitude all that I am and ever hope to be I owe it all to thee Yeah.
sing, Lord, to Thee. And should I gain any praise, let it go to Calvary. With His blood, He has saved. The book of Proverbs declares that those who are generous are blessed, for they share their bread with the poor. We do not bring bread today, but we offer a portion of God's gifts to us. May our gifts and our labors, whether paid or volunteered, meet the needs of those who often go without. Let us pray. Generous God, you call us to reach out to those in need, in kindness, rather than in judgment, with generosity, not simply good intentions. Bless our gifts and our actions for Christ's sake, that our faith in his love will show in our actions through the church that bears his name. Amen. Rest to me is grown.
Thank you for participating in worship today. May God keep you and protect you in the week ahead. And now for our weekly opportunities. When I first started announcing our in-person worship services reopening a number of weeks ago, I mentioned that things might have to change. Well, today I'm letting you know that things are changing. I have made the decision in consultation with others to make proof of vaccination mandatory for in-person worship participation. On September 2nd this past week, Ontario case counts jumped to almost 900 and 14 people died. The trends are alarming, particularly since the unvaccinated make up the majority of cases facing a greater likelihood of serious illness, hospitalization, and possibly death. Despite the government's decision to exempt churches from the new COVID passport initiative, our congregation is requiring proof of vaccination for the protection of the unvaccinated. We are still going ahead with reopening next Sunday, September the 12th at 10 a.m. I feel that it is an exciting day, and I know many of you have been looking forward to this day for some time. We will continue to take steps to ensure the safety of those participating, including public health restrictions such as wearing face masks, physical distancing, health check-in, and so on. Also, please note, physical distancing means that we will have limited space for seating in the sanctuary. Therefore, we are initiating pre-registration for worship services each week starting tomorrow. Between Monday and Friday noon, you will need to pre-register online or by calling the office and leaving a message to reserve a seat for Sunday. If you do not pre-register, we cannot guarantee there will be a seat for you. So please make sure you sign up ahead of time. And also note, only one person needs to sign up per family unit. So if you are a multiple of two people, three people, four people in the same family, you can all come together with simply one person registering for your, family, your whole family group. And now a message from our treasurer. Emmanuel family, thank you for your faithfulness and continued support in the ministries of Emmanuel during this season. It has been a long time since we gave you a financial update. Normally, the majority of the church's offerings come from passing the offering plate on Sunday mornings. During COVID, with in-person services suspended, this has not been possible. Since COVID, half of our offerings have been received by mail or by people dropping their offerings off at the church. A quarter of our offerings are being received by donations on our website, and the remaining quarter of our offerings are being received by people who have signed up to automatically give their offerings to the church through pre-authorized donations. This year, our total offerings have been following our normal offering pattern. However, during the summer months, our offerings have fallen off a bit. And at the end of August, we fell below our normal giving pattern by about 10,000, or approximately one week's worth of offerings. As the fall begins and we move to in-person services, our expenses will be going up. So please consider how you can support the ministries of Emmanuel at this time. Thank you again for your financial support for our ministries. And now for our benediction. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, 
and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all this day and forevermore. Oh.